and he commissioned his disciples he said to them go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit I don't remember in my lifetime and perhaps you don't remember in your lifetime that you have witnessed such mass conversion unto holy orthodoxy we thank God that those faithful people have found the true faith which once and for all was delivered to the saints purple haze and polka dots sergeant pepper and vietnam the 60s and 70s were all about the american young when a new generation forged its identity but for some the counterculture era was the setting of a quieter rebellion the 70s and most of us were kind of prudes i guess or something we didn't you know go into drugs we didn't you know protested about everything else, so we just protested about the church. And college kids tend to re-examine what they've been taught by their parents and the way that they've grown up, but I think that was particularly true in the 70s. And kids were, instead of going to church, when I was in college, people wanted to sit under a tree and read their Bible and things like that. In the 1960s was uh, a student at, on the campus at Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, and then John Braun came to campus to start a Campus Crusade for Christ chapter there. And uh, I was a freshman, and so I got involved in that. The common thread among all the people that started this was Campus Crusade for Christ. Many of us who became involved in Campus Crusade for Christ were very zealous for Christianity, very zealous for uh, trying to find out what it meant to be a, a genuine Christian. There were seven, seven men that were that all had been with Campus Crusade for Christ that were headed up this movement. Um, Father Peter, Father John Braun, Father Gordon Walker, Dick Ballou, Father Jack Sparks, Ken Mervin, and Ray Nethery. What they did was evangelize of the college campuses and they, uh, they did very well at it. Father John Braun was just the most incredible speaker in the world and Father Peter Gilquist evangelizes as he breathes. I wouldn't say I've never seen anything like it before but I've never seen anything like it before. Mary was a student at Memphis State University in 1968. She and several other students arranged for Peter Gilquist and John Braun to speak on campus in October of that year. Father John Braun alone had 17 speaking engagements on campuses, fraternities, sororities. The same year John Braun evangelized the Memphis campus, he, Peter Gilquist, and five of their colleagues felt something was missing from their ministry. They were worrying about well, what happened to all these kids that they brought to Christ and then they left. You know, was somebody taking care of them? There was a real problem in their eyes that they would, people would become Christians, would, would, would understand the truth, and then if they graduated, they had no place to go and they drifted away. They needed the nourishment of a church and a stability and to learn the true doctrines and theology that a church would offer instead of being just a Christian out there beating around trying to make it. The Campus Crusade was going to evangelize only and that was as far as it went and they knew there had to be more, there had to be a place for people to land and the churches in the country, churches in America at the time just weren't the place they could land. Seven Campus Crusade leaders left the organization, convinced they could never offer the fullness of the faith as a parachurch ministry. They set out to find the New Testament church, but in doing so, Peter Gilquist acknowledged that they had left accomplished, stable positions to simply strike out in faith and start all over again. He started over in Memphis with a new job and a new approach to ministry. He had to find a job, but he, could, and he became director of development at Memphis State. So, and then he had us over to his house every Sunday night at 9 o'clock. 
So we went to Pete's. There would probably be 30 people at least in every meeting, and every meeting probably averaged at least 10 new persons every time. That's a lot of folks that went through his house, and to this day I still meet people that said, oh yeah, I'm in a couple meetings over there on Carr Avenue. The group that met originally on Carr Avenue experienced a lot of change over the next few years. Many people came and went, but a core group of committed individuals eventually formed and remained. I went to this Bible study group and I was so amazed that people were flipping through their Bibles and reading scripture and praying and loving God and that's who I wanted people I wanted to be around. At that time I was uh, really without what I would call a church home, having been away from uh, the Baptist church during my college years and having visited a number of churches and uh, really finding that none of them were really uh, striking the chord that I thought I was looking for in a church. After I graduated from college and came to Memphis for a job, uh, I met Tim and John McGee through a friend, and I was just interested in being a part of a Christian group of friends. Those people who sort of had connections with one another were also asking these questions. What does it mean to be the church? What is worship? How are we to find these things? One year in 1978, uh, within a 12-month period, 11 families, households, moved in within walking distance. By moving into the same neighborhood, while I think it was an unusual thing to do, uh, it did allow us to really help one another and to have that sense of belonging and sharing our lives together. We were brothers and sisters in the Lord and became family. But Memphis was not the only place where a community of committed believers had formed. House churches with ties to seven leaders who left Campus Crusade had organized in various parts of the country. Those leaders who had left Campus Crusade who understood themselves to be, uh, have fathered many groups of Christians around the country and what they hadn't really done was left them with any kind of uh, structure or organization or at least uh, a way of being together and to worship and to pray and to be the church. And so they one by one went around to all of these places and said look we recognize we have fathered a lot of children in the faith and we don't want them to be orphans. We're willing to take some responsibility as this New Covenant Apostolic Order to, um, to provide leadership. In 1974, they formed what was called the New Covenant Apostolic Order. So our churches started taking on names like New Covenant. We were called New Covenant Community Church here in Memphis. The NCAO gave different ones of their leaders responsibilities to start, study certain areas. I remember them saying we know a lot about what the church was from the Protestant Reformation forward but we know very little about what happened from prior to the Protestant Reformation. One person was studying history, another person was studying worship, another was studying government, another was studying the scriptures to make sure all of it made sense. And then they would re report back to each other Periodically, what'd you learn? Our leaders would come here and say, okay, this is what most of Christians, most everywhere have believed, so this is what we're gonna start doing. And they would say, okay, you make the sign of the cross like this. That when we do uh, two fingers down for the two natures of Christ and we put the three together, that's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and we touch our head and our heart and our strength and our arm, that that was like the savior, that was the saving theology, saving doctrine of the church, the true doctrine of the church. It wasn't the fullness picture that we saw. We just saw little pieces get filled in and then we would practice those little pieces. Now it wasn't always exciting. Sometimes it was incredibly challenging. For a Presbyterian to begin to even consider reverence of Mary as the mother of God was a completely, it wasn't just foreign, it was hostile. Somehow, even, even if things were not what I was used to or what I was comfortable with, that didn't do away with, with it being the way we were supposed to go. That didn't do away with, definitely didn't do with the way, away with the fact that that's how the early church always worshiped and that we wanted to be like the early church. Certainly it was becoming very clear that as we looked at church history that for the first thousand years and then what happened after that, that we really agreed uh, theologically and, and what was being done 
in the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church, in our estimation, in our understanding, in our reading, in our study, uh, Orthodox Church was the only one that really could claim an actual unbroken lineage to the Twelve Apostles. The excitement was that we, it was all right. It was historically, factually, and, and internally, it was just right. And we knew it. We couldn't, we couldn't avoid it. The entire community of churches scattered around the country took the name Evangelical Orthodox Church in 1979. The group's commitment to Orthodox worship also began to take shape in their services. Everything we would do, we would put in practice. So we, we started looking like an Orthodox church. Um, you know, albeit small icons on the table with a cloth in our living room. But we started having that. We started having the prayers. We started um, having the priests wear black. We started having Eucharist the same way. So it was a process. And I would be less than candid to say that from 1975 to 1987, it was sort of smooth sailing. It was anything but. Beginning a church is, requires much suffering, much travail, like almost like having a baby. Even as the church struggled through many changes, the community held together. We wanted our children to have as much continuity in the way they were being raised in a community-based church that was on the path to orthodoxy. During my young childhood, we weren't orthodox, but, we were, but there was very definitely a strong sense of community. And I think that that simplicity of life, in a way, I guess, that comes from having a community of friends and have those same people be the ones that you live close by, that you go to church with, that you go to school with, it lets you have this real integrated life as a, as a kid that feels very, just wonderful. But the Evangelical Orthodox Church had not reached the end of their journey. They felt there was something still missing. Because the more we studied, the more we understood that what, what it means to be in the church is to be incarnationally connected to Christ and to His Twelve. And the only place that you can do that is you, go to, you have to go to those churches that are. We weren't. The word we kept using is one day we will land in orthodoxy. So that was, the, that was the intent of where we were going, to hook up one day with a historic Orthodox Church. They knew early on that Orthodox was where we needed to be. It was just how did we get there. If they were to be received into the canonical Orthodox Church as a group, they had to obtain a blessing from the highest level of church authority. Patriarch Ignatius IV presided over one of the seven Orthodox jurisdictions, Antioch. And our trying to land in canonical orthodoxy we had visited with other jurisdictions and had not really found a very open door and it was almost by uh, happenstance that uh, we had a meeting not me of course but others leaders for our, our churches uh, had a meeting with the patriarch in 1985 and the patriarch was very gracious but uh, metropolitan philip was there at that same meeting and and the two of them were very kind and uh, when uh, uh, three of our priests go and, uh, and to meet them and to take their blessing and to ask their wisdom and, and uh, the patriarch and Metropolitan Philip met with those three priests from our churches uh, for about an hour I believe and at the end the patriarch turns to Metropolitan Philip and he says, uh, your eminence I want to see you, I want you to try to help these people. The patriarch's gesture established an important dialogue between the Evangelical Orthodox Church and Metropolitan Philip, the leader of the Antiochian Orthodox Church in North America. In 1986, uh, having done lots of investigation, His Eminence in, invited all of our churches to, to, to come into canonical orthodoxy, and he described how that would take place. When we were looking at the prospect of coming into the Orthodox Church, and 1987, each one of us needed to decide whether we wanted to uh, apply to Metropolitan Philip to be, uh, to remain as a priest or a deacon. We were chrismated and ordained in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and it was a two-day event. So on Saturday, March the 14th, uh, we were all to be received as uh, catechumens and received into the church and chrismated that day. All these people were all 
chrismated at once. It was it's like a long line coming up for communion, except we we're coming up for chrismation. And those of us who would be ordained as priests the following day, that Sunday, March the 15th, would be ordained that Saturday as deacons first. For some of us, the first time we were in an Orthodox church was when we were chrismated. When we were chrismated, we really had no idea what we were doing. I had never been in an Orthodox church before. I was being ordained as a deacon, and I really didn't know really what that meant. The magnitude of it, we just couldn't quite grasp. It was like a whirlwind. I mean, <laughs> it was happening so fast, it's hard to, it was hard to soak it up. I remember being on the verge of tears the whole day. It was just, it was the highlight of my life. I cried throughout the whole chrismation and just seeing something that we had searched for for so long and just couldn't believe we had found it. I think more than anything else, just the joy of knowing, hey, you know, this is the pearl of great price and we know what it is now. It was something that all of us who had traveled a journey together thus far were doing together. And it felt like we were home. We had, not that the journey was finished, but at least we knew where we were. And it was a good place. It was a good place. Becoming Orthodox, it was such a relief. And I felt such a thing of safety. And just, I was just really overwhelmed with being in touch with the ancient Orthodox Church. And I didn't know how we did it. I mean, it had to be God. I didn't know how we did it. But being chrismated and ordained um, was, to me, more of an interchange that happened in me, of, of one of knowing I'd finally arrived uh, in the Orthodox faith. Father John Braun was in town with that, and afterward he, he said there's a, there's a mystic reality in, in, in becoming Orthodox. You, it's, it's before you, we became Orthodox, we didn't know what it meant. Afterward, we understood. Um, we changed. We were, we were different people. I do remember standing out uh, outside the church after having been ordained as a priest on that Sunday and people coming up uh, to congratulate me and feeling like this is way beyond what I would have ever thought <laughs> and feeling a little out of place. Not that it shouldn't have happened, but like who am I to, to wear these, these, these vestments and, and to, for people to call me a priest. It was, it was pretty, pretty far beyond what I would have ever contemplated for my life. Getting this building uh, and converting it from, from a Protestant building to an Orthodox building was a huge milestone. I can remember many work, work parties on Saturday and we were nailing floors down and, and uh, removing some walls and painting and cleaning and something that the children helped with. It was, it was really a, a community type project that we were making this a place that, that would be a you know, a wonderful place to worship. The people from Lindsay Memorial Church were going to remove the pipe organs and these beautiful stained glass windows that were between the pipe organs in the area that we now have as an altar. And when all that came down, there was just the most beautiful apse. God prepared it for us, I think. Uh, he had us in mind when He built it because it was very easily you know, transitioned into a, an altar area that, that we could use in, a, in, in, in an orthodox fashion. Father Viran came over from Annunciation Church and just threw up his hands and uh, said, oh, this is always supposed to be an orthodox church. I see a lot of people coming in and young people who are dedicated, and that's real exciting. I would love to see our church keep growing, and I'm sure it will. Um, 
you know, I leave to go to school and I come back and I don't know half the people. I have people come up to me and welcome me in the church and it's hard to say, well, that lady over there is my mother actually and I actually did grow up here. As we continue to change and grow with new people, it just shows me that this is the one true faith. We've been so fortunate to attract uh, new young people and have our own kids, uh, some of whom stay here and uh, continue to worship here and have kids here. It's gratifying every time I'm here to see uh, how, many, uh, how many young people and how many children are part of this vibrant community. The Sunday before I left um, for my freshman year in college, um, I cried all the way through liturgy um, because the church here um, was as much my family as my own immediate family. I think in many ways I learned about orthodoxy with my mother. Um, we kind of grew up in the church together. Um, and that I think that brought us closer together. One of the main things that I've inherited from my years here and my formation here is understanding and a, an example in my mind in my memory of how a community can be together and how Christ can be at the center of a community. I rejoice in the fact that God has given me a place to repent and to know that He brings me back every time I do to the very place where I can partake of Him in a mystery beyond any understanding. How did I become a part of this? A, a, a young fellow from a Southern Baptist church in Calhoun City, Mississippi, how did he find orthodoxy and, and, and I think that's uh, just a picture of how much God loves us. Often people come to me and ask me about praying um, and I always tell them I'm not a very good prayer. And one of the things I suggest that they do is to uh, thank God for the things that they've been given. I don't feel like, hey, look what we found, you know, I don't want to go say to somebody, look what we found, but it's like, look what God has done to me. He's, he's cleaned my eyes. He's cleaned the dirt. And I see something that's, that's always been there. Today, when I pray, the first thing I do is I just pray, thank God for giving me life, for giving me an opportunity to know Him. And I thank him for my family, first of all, my wife. And I thank him for all these people.